Chapter 42. The Importance of Choosing Names. The bell above the door rang timidly, as though whoever pulled it didn't actually want to be heard. I looked up from my drafting table to where Master Payoon sat bent over his desk. He eyed me beneath his bushy eyebrows. I'm not expecting anything today. It must be for you. I rose from my table and threaded the narrow pathway through the tall stacks of crates and boxes that we still hadn't unpacked. Blast, I cried as I stubbed my toe. This shop is a crowded mess. Hmm, mumbled Payoon, nodding, and more packages and orders arriving every day. I sighed and swung the door open. The delivery boy took off his hat and crumpled it against his chest as he bowed to me. Good afternoon, miss. His cheeks flushed the color of a raw beet. He thrust a cream-colored envelope at me. I've got a letter for you, miss. I smiled. Don't call me miss. I've told you. It's just sigh. I took the envelope from him and searched in my pocket for a tip. I could feel his eyes on me. When I handed him the coin, he whispered, Is it all true, miss? Was what true? What they say in the papers about you? About what you found on the Sunderlands? I leaned closer and nodded gravely. Every word. Tripe, he whispered. His eyes widened. I could tell that his mind was conjuring up images of all sorts of grim horrors. Thank you for this. I turned to go back inside and nearly tripped over another stack of boxes near the door. Hey, I called after the boy. Hey, kid, how old are you? Me? Twelve next month, miss. We need an assistant around here. You want the job? The boy's mouth fell open. What? Me? But I... I couldn't. He shuffled his feet, an emotion I knew well, covering one tattered shoe with the toe of the other. I don't know how to read, he said quietly. I waved my hand in the air. That doesn't matter. I'll teach you. I just need someone who shows up on time and works hard. Oh, I am always on time, he shouted, then added more softly. I mean, I would be on time and work hard. You could count on me, miss. Good. Come tomorrow and we'll get started. But not too early, all right? He bowed and took off, skipping down Plumeria Lane. I shut the door, chuckling to myself. What was that about? asked Payoon. I just hired someone. He nodded. Hmm, about time. And what's the letter? From the naval secretary again? I turned the envelope over. My name was scribbled across the front in blotchy print. No, sir, it's from Bo. Payoon smiled and raised an eyebrow. That's your third letter from him this week, isn't it? Now I was blushing as much as the delivery boy. He's just bored, that's all, I said, ripping open the envelope. Besides, it's good for him to practice his handwriting. It's horrendous. I took the letter back to my desk and read it. Dear Sai, thanks for sending me the book about the pirates. I liked that one. It had lots of gore. Much better than the boring scuzz my tutor makes me read. He told me my language was uncouth, so I picked his pocket to teach him a lesson. Don't worry, I gave it all back, eventually. Mum is doing so much better, you wouldn't believe it. We go walking on the beach near the house every day. I'm almost sad to leave, but I'm also really excited for our trip. Mum says she wants you and Payoon to come up and stay with us before we sail for Anlong. Please say yes. I'll even ask the cook to make you clam stew. Your friend, Bo. P.S. That's Lord Bo to you, vulture turd. I put the letter with the others in my desk drawer, fighting not to laugh out loud. The thought of Bo being told to watch his language was just too funny. And it cheered me up to hear how well Captain Sangra was doing. Everything could have turned out so very differently. I looked up at Master Payoon, inspecting my work with his belly pooched out and his chin tucked in. He didn't look much like a seafaring hero, but that's exactly what he was. After we abandoned Payoon on Avon's Island, he had immediately chartered one of the little whaling barks to follow us. He knew there was no way to stop Rian, but he also worried we might need help. With just a handful of hardy sailors, he commanded the rusty whaler to the northern edge of the Harbinger Sea. There he found floating debris tossed from the prosperity during the storm, our snapped mast and shredded sails. 
As they searched for survivors, they spotted one of our lost rowboats. When they hauled the boat in, they were shocked to find a woman inside, clinging to life, Captain Sangra. She kept repeating the same impossible story. After Rian had thrown her overboard, a great beast with a hide of glittering armor had pushed the rowboat across the waves toward her with its bearded snout. Sangra had managed to climb inside, and that rowboat had saved her life. The doctors said it was a fever dream, but Sangra stuck to her story. The dragon had watched over her, staring with its golden eye, almost as if it pitied her, as if it understood her. Shaken by seeing the wreckage of the prosperity, Payun and his crew were convinced that we had perished in the Harbinger Sea, so Payun reluctantly abandoned his search for us in order to bring the captain safely home to Mankon. When we sailed the prosperity back into Gold Hope Harbor, it was a shock to everyone. Bo and Sangra were reunited, with many tears, no matter what Bo denies. And I was reunited with Master Payun, also with many tears, no matter what each of us denies. With her son finally at her side, Sangra began to recover. True to her word, she was done hiding him. Her family cut her off, but that didn't matter to her or to anyone else. During the nine months of our voyage, Anjali Sangra's fame had only grown. And after the story of her brush with death on the open sea, she became the most popular public figure in Mankan. People were touched by her devotion to her son and inspired by their reunion. Something was changing in our kingdom. A small change, but a change all the same. Captain Sangra was still a fearless warrior, but she was fighting a new battle now. She had her lineal melted down, something that had once been unimaginable, but now just seemed practical. Who needed to carry around all that extra weight anyway? Most of her prize money of the 150,000 lex for captaining the ship that discovered the Sunderlands had been put into a scholarship fund for children in need. She planned to use her prestige to pressure the queen to make reforms at home and abroad, and she and Beau were leaving soon on a sailing trip through our nine islands to spread the word and build support among our people. Rian couldn't hurt them any more, especially not when she was in custody awaiting trial for mutiny and attempted murder. As for me, when we returned to An Lung, I had gone to the Fens and found our apartment boarded up and mud gone. He had left the money tin for me, in care of Catfish, who shockingly had spent only half of it. I went to the prisons and the workhouses, but I couldn't find mud anywhere. Catfish said he disappeared from the city about a week after our ship had set sail. I had inquiries out all over on Lung, but hadn't found him yet. I didn't know what I would say to him when we did meet again. I knew that it wouldn't be easy, but he was my father, and I didn't want to lose my only link to my past. As for my future, I had a new place to go home to. It's getting late, Sai. Master Payun reached into his pocket and brought out his new favorite toy, a pocket watch. I had taken the cash prize instead of the lineal of honor, and the watch was one of the first things I had bought. Payun's eyeglass hung on the wall in a glass case behind his desk. He checked his pocket watch proudly, then checked it one more time for good measure. It's nearly five. Shall we close up the shop and head home for supper? We can stop by the three onions and pick up some noodle soup. That sounds wonderful, sir. I'm just finishing up here, and then I'll be ready. Ah, uh, are those the final touches on the Sunderland's map? Payun rose from his chair and shuffled to my table. May I take a look? I leaned back so he could see. He stood quietly for a long time, and then a smile crinkled the corners of his eyes. Sigh, he whispered. This is extraordinary work, and the names you have chosen couldn't be more perfect. The great southern continent sprawled across the paper in front of me. While the crew repaired our ship, Bo and I had hiked up and down as much of the coast as we could. I had used my notes and sketches to draw this new map in all its precise detail. We never saw any people or any other dragons. Perhaps the slake and her young were the only ones of their kind left in the world. I knew that one day not even she could stop people from reaching the Sunderlands, but at least my map could slow them down. I had chosen the names for every beach, bay, and headland. I'd written each word in my own handwriting this time. Sand Flea Beach, Destitution Harbor, Starvation Point, 
Deathfall Cove. I wanted the names I chose to paint a certain picture of the Sunderlands in the minds of anyone who read the map. To help things along, I gave every newspaper and on lung detailed accounts of how Bo and I nearly starved to death, baked to a crisp on barren, black sand beaches while foraging for putrid clams. It was all true. It just wasn't the whole story. Of course, the sailors who returned with us painted a different picture, one of a lush, perfect paradise. But no one ever believes sailors' tales. Payune helped me lift the map off my table and lay it carefully in the glass frame we made for it. When we were done, we hung it on the wall next to his many other maps from all over the world. There, said Payune, taking a step back, that is a wonderful start to your career. We turned out the lights and shut the door behind us. As I locked up, I glanced at the new letters painted on our shop banner. Paiyun Wang Yai, Master Mapmaker, and Sud Sai Madwan, Mapmaker in Training.